Hello, I'm Thomas Smith. I'm CEO of Gato Images, and we're an AI-driven editorial agency based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm also the chair of this year's conference at DMLA and also the Education and Programs Committee for the DMLA. Um, I want to just, before we get started here um, on discussing synthetic content, let's take a moment to thank our sponsors, thank everyone for attending, our sponsors, StockTrack, Image Rights, CDAS, SmartFrame, Capture, Pick Rights, and Google really make this conference possible, so thank you for that. Um, I'm really pleased to bring back uh, the panelists who joined me yesterday to talk about synthetic content. Um, we have uh, Tyler uh, Lastovic here from Generated Media um, and Ashish uh, from Microsoft. We've got Victor from um, Synthesia and then Paul Reinitz from Getty Images uh, who can talk to us about market issues and, uh, and other things in the industry. So we've got a, a really great group um, bringing back here. Hopefully some of you uh, were at the original session, um, but if not, I'm just gonna ask each of the panelists here to give a really brief you know, 30 second uh, elevator speech of who they are, what their company does, and then we'll, uh, we'll lead into questions. Um, if you have questions for the panelists, this is meant to be sort of a follow-up and an opportunity to talk directly. Um, I'll ask some questions, but uh, feel free to use the chat feature. You can send a chat out to everyone, or if you want it to be a private question, send it just to me, and uh, I'll be bringing questions forward for our panelists to answer today. Um, so let's start off just with some introductions. Um, Tyler, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself and Generated Media? Sure. I'll quick share my screen. So uh, so my name is Tyler Lastovich. I lead strategy at Generated Photos and the parent company, Generated Media. Uh, right now, we are a synthetic media company that produces commercial photos of people and faces, specifically portraits, uh, using a new technology called GANs, or a Generative Adversarial Network. These photos are completely synthetic. They are not real in any form, and so therefore they carry different rights than traditional photos do. Uh, we have a, a full platform that we power that lets people search by characteristics and we have a full API, and now we're offering full synthetic data sets for other machine learning products. As you can see on the screen here, there's an example of a, a person that we've created. It's a fairly recent capture um, from our database. My background is in engineering, uh, previously supercomputing and cloud computing. And so if you do have any technical sides for the engineering kind of aspect of this technology, uh, feel free to go for it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and then Victor, why don't you uh, go next and introduce yourself and Synthesia. Yeah, thanks, Tom. <clears throat> so my name is Victor and I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Synthesia. And what we do is we make it easier for everyone to create video content. We have an online platform that allows you to log in, choose an AI presenter and simply type in text. And from that text will then generate a video asset. So technology is uh, in some ways similar to, um, to what Tyler is doing with photos. We're doing it with video. And what we're mostly empowering people to do is create things like talking head style videos for onboarding, for training, uh, for sales, or for uh, general sort of online education, where a video asset is much more effective than uh, a text asset or, or an image asset. Uh, I'll just quickly show what the platform looks like. Uh, so I can just share my screen. What you're looking at here is the Synthesia platform. Um, access starts from $30 and up. So we are kind of a pretty accessible tool to begin with. We can jump into the actors pane here. You can see the selection of actors. These are, are still real people um, who get paid by each video that's generated with them. If I want to create a video with Anna, for example, I would jump into my creation pane here, simply start typing in some text. Um, I can reposition her. I can do various things with the video, make her into a circle like this, uh, export as a green screen, lay on a background, which can be a video, or it can be an image, um, and then once you create the video, it takes around five to 10 minutes and your video will then be ready. And we support 40 different languages. So if I type in Danish here, which is where I'm from originally and where I am right now, you'll see changes to Danish. So this is the kind of basic concept. We also have an API that allows you to do this at scale and create personalized experiences for users. Um, and to kind of end that off, I'll just try and, and play this video and see if it goes through on Skype or sorry, on Zoom, usually should be okay. Hi, and welcome to the DMLA conference. Here's a video generated on the Synthesia platform by simply typing in text. I look forward to speaking more about synthetic media on the panel today. See you soon. 
So I'm not, not sure how well that sort of uh, went through the Zoom. Otherwise, please check out our website, synthesia.io. You can also create a free video for yourself. Um, it's simply just typing in the script and you will get uh, a video back. So that's me from, in terms of my own background, uh, I am uh, from, uh, sorry, just turn the screen share up here. Uh, my, my background is in uh, both uh, engineering and in, in product. So I can also happily ask uh, or answer technical questions. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about some easier. Wonderful. Um, and then uh, Ashish, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, yourself? And Ashish is here also to address deep fakes, which um, probably a lot of people in the editorial space will be aware of. Some others might not be, but these are synthetic videos that are photorealistic and are created usually for nefarious reasons. So um, Ashish can talk a little bit about what he does at Microsoft to combat that. Sure, thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, I'm Ashish German. I'm uh, part of Microsoft's uh, Customer Security and Trust Organization. Uh, I focus on uh, a program called Defending Democracy. Uh, we have three pillars, campaign security, election integrity and disinformation defense. And I lead the work on disinformation defense, uh, especially focusing on deep fakes for last uh, 12 plus months uh, with a lens of uh, policy regulation uh, and technology. Uh, we think, uh, when you think about deep fakes uh, or synthetic media uh, for AI generated synthetic media, uh, could be manipulation of pictures, images, oh, sorry, pictures, videos, audio, or even text. Uh, most of the time, you know, we being a technology company think of uh, positive use cases uh, as every technology that we produce, you know, to enable people to create, you know, or empower humans to augment their agencies. Uh, but what we also have seen is defects can be weaponized to inflict harm. Uh, so we also have uh, created this, what we call a threat model or a harms uh, framework around defects on uh, especially thinking very hard about, you know, what it can do to inflict harm on individuals, businesses, society, and, and democratic institutions. Uh, I'm a technologist as well. I've been with Microsoft 15 years in various roles. Uh, so lately I'm, I'm more like a tech diplomat. So I talk policy and technology, but my background is engineering. Thank you. And then finally, Paul, um, do you wanna give a little background on, on you? And Paul's here mainly to discuss um, the legal aspects, legal challenges around synthetic content, some of the evolving thinking there. And he can comment a little bit too about you know, how this relates specifically to our industry. Sure, thank, thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, uh, everyone else. I really enjoyed the, the panel yesterday. And I thought it was a good discussion. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to getting into it more today. Um, give a little bit of background. So I am the Director of uh, Legal Advocacy and Operations at Getty Images. Um, synthetic content is something that we've been really interested in um, for a bit of time now. Um, obviously, it could, you know, there's the potential for it to impact the industry quite a bit. Um, and I think that, uh, as you know, as I discussed yesterday, it brings up a lot of um, novel legal considerations um, uh, around copyright, around uh, privacy, and and several several other issues. Um, and you know, primarily, you know. What we've been advocating for is we, we want to see innovation in the area, but we want to see responsible innovation. We want to make sure that human creators aren't aren't lost um, in in the shuffle here. Um, and if uh, underlying uh, IP is used in in the process of creating new synthetic content, uh, those underlying creators are um, you know are are considered and and compensated if appropriate. Um, for for their use. Wonderful, thank you. So um, again, if anybody has questions for the panelists, please put those in chat. Um, if you want it to be visible to everybody, uh, put it to everyone. If you want it to be a private question, feel free to send it directly to me. Um, I think we got some really interesting and, and compelling questions and discussion from the panel. Um, one thing that uh, that came out of that was, um, you know, people I think were wondering. Uh, how long until this content is totally indistinguishable from, um, you know, content that you would see uh, created from a, a traditional production environment? 
uh, with photographers and that kind of thing. So how far are we? Um, and I'll understand you on the panel. Technically, um, you know, do you think from content that's totally indistinguishable from reality? I'm, I'm happy to, to give my take on that. So I think the way to think about when is it like fully realistic is you have to think of that as in different use cases, right? Um, you know, our kind of vision is that in 10 years time, you could create a full Hollywood blockbuster on your laptop without needing any cameras or access to studios. Um, there's obviously still loads of technology that needs to be developed. Uh, it's a bold vision, but I truly do think that we're going to get there within 10 to 15 years. So this is like a Hollywood blockbuster style film, right, where you can really basically recreate any type of video um, on your laptop. I think where we are at today is that, um, you know, for being in synthetic media for almost three years, is that now we're seeing the technology become good enough for certain use cases. So um, Tyler mentioned some of the use cases that they, got, they had, they're working on um, like stock photography, for example. Uh, I think for us, it's the same thing. We're not doing TV ads yet, but for talking head style content around education and training, the content is definitely good enough. Um, and then, you know, as the kind of technology progresses, it'll unlock more use cases. And, you know, maybe in two or three years, you can create kind of simple advertisements. And in six or seven years, you can create maybe 60% of a Hollywood film using these kind of technologies. And um, so that's one uh, dimension to that answer. I think another dimension, which is uh, the one that I'm sort of more interested in is, depends what you compare it with, right? If you're comparing it with doing, and I'm talking very much from what we do today as in video, if you compare a training video on the Synthesia platform uh, with one that was shot with a real camera and a real actor, it's definitely not there yet, right? But I really don't think that that's what you should compare this sort of stuff with. Like I, I see ourselves as competing with text, not with video. Um, is it a better experience to get a synthetic video than a four page PDF document teaching you how to uh, follow COVID-19 guidelines? That's the actual comparison you have to make. I'm not advocating that people should stop making the six o'clock news uh, like they've always done or that they should not create, uh, you know, nice, uh, beautifully made branding videos and things like that. That's not what this is about. I think this is about the world is moving into a much more visual place, an incident in particular, where video and images will be the predominant way of communicating with each other. And these tools is going to facilitate that. So I think that um, uh, I, th I think that's kind of uh, quite important. Uh, I just thought there's a question the, in the uh, chat. I don't know if that's for now, but lots of real life use cases, HR training, onboarding, and that's definitely where it's for, for, for my perspective where this stuff's good enough today. Yeah, yeah. To, to add quickly to that, just as a follow on on the use cases, I think it depends on the, the reference material that you're comparing it with. Uh, so if you're looking at is it real compared to a video game? I mean, we can get pretty close there. We are working with a number of video game companies. So what you have today, I would say still has an uncanny valley from say a Call of Duty game or something like that to what a real life image is. And so I think the, the near term applications of real life are much uh, closer in. And th that'll be really interesting in the next even a couple of years as like Unreal Engine 5 and things like that come out, we'll have better 2D to 3D projection and, and all sorts of cool use cases that I'm sure Victor will take use of as well. I think that's a good segue into the question for um, Ashish. You know, on the you're you're sort of more on the detection side, not for legitimate uses like um, Victor and Ty and uh, Tyler are describing, but um, you know, deep fakes where it's somebody who's trying to inflict harm. Does this keep you up at night? Is it scary <laughs> scary to think that you know the technologies will continue to advance, or do you think it's something where detection? Uh, technologies will advance kind of in, in lockstep, and uh, it'll end up keeping pace. No, I, I, absolutely. But I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back and, and say, hey, you know, the kind of polarization and social discord we are seeing, actually, we don't need deep fakes actually to, to exacerbate that, that problem. But with that said, uh, deep fakes, uh, especially the, the quality of it is improving. Uh, audio, in fact, is, is, is very much at parity these days. Uh, with little effort, it can actually become, uh, in fact, we have a technology called custom neural voice, uh, which can, with very few utterances, uh, can create uh, a full voice model. Uh, and then, then, you know, it can, it can, once you have the voice model, then you can let it say anything you want. Uh, so what detection is hard, but things intervention wise, the thing that we, as a responsible platform company. I'll give you an example on, on custom neural uh, voice that we have. 
we have developed a, a, a what we call a harms framework. And the bottom line there is that service is a platform as a service delivery. So essentially we have the service sits on a platform and can be used within those acceptable terms of uses. And if we see uh, reported that that particular technology is used uh, in a nefarious way, we can cut access to, to that particular customer. So we, we go through that list of, hey, once we verify who the customer is, what their use cases is, uh, and then only give them access. And even after that, if, if it, it is used for bad purposes, we can cut off. So that's one way to think about how to intervene because detection, we saw from Facebook detection challenge, the best uh, of the minds actually participated uh, and the best precision we got was around 65% on detection on, on video defects, which is like a slightly better than a coin toss, right? <laughs> so, 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 so yes, it does keep me awake at night. In fact, you know, this is one of the things that I do in Microsoft is trying to figure out that, that threat modeling and what interventions we can do. And we came to a conclusion that, hey, we have to do something till we have this longer term vision of authentication and provenance where you know you can have authoritative content which i think yesterday victor were talking about trustful and, and and untrusted content but that is long way that is very very far away you know when i say very far away the, the way the technology you know improves and innovation is happening these days you know five ten years is, is very far away uh, but till then we have to just keep on winning this cat and mouse game which is seriously very hard, right? It is harder than the cybersecurity cat and mouse game. Yeah, it sounds like um, verifying the content, ultimately the provenance is gonna be more significant than detecting it after the fact. Um, Paul, is this, is this something um, on the legal side where there's any kind of framework starting to be built? Um, you mentioned a little bit that there's specific legislation, not so much on copyright, but um, questions like privacy, and you mentioned um, some state specific laws, um, how, how are we starting to see legislation or, or sort of legal framework starting to be built around policing synthetic content? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's still early early on in um, in, in the, the legal, I guess, reaction to this. And I think as is the case almost always is, um, you know, laws are going to lag behind the technology. And, and I think especially in a technology like this, which is constantly evolving, it's really, really hard to come up with laws that um, that can stop sort of bad behavior. I think it's almost it's almost like a challenge sometimes to to engineers. Uh, you come up with a law that potentially stops one technology from happening. It's like okay, we'll figure out another way to to do this. Um, and it's uh, it, it it is. I, I think to the credit of of legislators, um, you know, internationally, I think many have recognized that um, and it doesn't really make sense to come up with specific laws that are say targeted to stop deep fakes i think it's more about uh interpreting you know existing laws like like the, the body of copyright law um to to think about using that as a way to potentially stop deep fakes and so as i you know mentioned briefly and and went into more detail yesterday um uh, like so, the current technology GANs for you know for creating synthetic content, it relies on a large um, body of of data of of uh, image data, and uh, you know, I, I like Tyler has is working on you know that doesn't always have to be copyrighted data, um, it could even be synthetic data, but you know if it is and you know i think a lot of bad actors aren't necessarily thinking about copyright implications and that might be one way to sort of to to get them um say so how how was this created what was it what was this trained on and if you don't get answers for that that might be you know a way to say stop some sort of like uh, i think she had mentioned the the deep nudes um application the other day you know that might be a way to 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 stop an application from that from being commercially exploited. Uh, it's are there are there potential copyright um, violations that they have um, or have they infringed on copyright? Um, and then beyond that, I think especially in in Europe, uh, legislators are are thinking about uh, regulation of AI in general 
and they're looking at what they consider high risk applications and thinking about uh, about certain ways to regulate that. I brought this up yesterday. You know, one of the ideas is is uh, for to show sort of you know good faith from uh, from developers is create uh, auditable records of of how you are actually training these these models, what data is being used. Doesn't necessarily need to be disclosed by law, but it, if it is available then if there is a legal dispute, it could potentially be discoverable. Um, and, the, and those are those are the sort of things um, that, that legislators are looking at and, and that you know, Getty Images at, is advocating for. Thank you, yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the data question is also one that's, um, I think, significant in other ways too. Um, what, you know, what's being used to build um, the models that then create this synthetic content um, I shared, so to the use case question, I shared one example of, uh, of a video we created for a YouTube channel that we um, used for some, some testing of product videos using Synthesia's technologies. I'm gonna share now also a link to an article um, that I developed about um, a, a use case for generated media's technology, which is improving um, diversity in other data sets. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday during the follow-up. Um, but I think there's sort of a, a two-part question to this. One is, um, Tyler, if you can talk a little bit about how that works and how you can use fake people to improve uh, recognition of real people um, and how generated media is working on that, I think that would be great. And then a, a sort of follow-on question, um, maybe back to Paul, uh, is this an opportunity to supply data to companies like generated media or Synthesia from our industry? Um, so, uh, Tyler, do you want to jump in there? Sure. Yeah. I, I think that one of the main reasons we started Generated Media is, is really to help with the diversity problem. Uh, and a lot of the people that are working at Generated Media now have a background in some sort of either stock photography or photo field. Uh, we have a full team of photographers and operate a photo studio. Uh, so the, a big part of what we're doing is sourcing you know, diverse models and different people from uh, all over. Uh, so we can capture them in high definition in all sorts of different poses and emotions and create these large data sets. Uh, right now, what you're seeing, especially in the open source community where a lot of this machine learning work gets developed is that they're just taking these kind of bottom barrel, free scraped data sets. And they often have very, very poor uh, bias compositions between either ages or races or sex, gender, all of the different parts that you're looking for uh, it, it's really poorly represented and we've inspected a number of these data sets and very few of them are anywhere close to balanced and most of them are extremely biased. And so what we're doing is we're creating technologies and specifically training machine learning models to be able to generate specific types of people. Uh, I know it sounds a little dystopian, but it's really in good faith to do this where we can generate a, someone of a certain race of a certain sex with a certain color skin or those type of style mixing elements where I think that that is not just important to create massive balanced data sets, but it's important to help other companies kind of shore up what they already have in IP. Um, so you're not necessarily having to do all of the work yourself and license all of this from the same data set. Because the problem you get is if everyone's training on the exact same data, you have the same results no matter what. And so you want diversity in data, you want diversity all across the, the board with these. And Paul, maybe you can jump in and, and talk a little bit. Have you seen um, in the market at the moment, are there possibilities for people in our industry to supply diverse training data? What would that look like? Um, and from the legal side, you talked a little bit about it yesterday, but uh, specifically what kind of language should we be working into our model releases to make sure that we uh, allow for that use case down the line? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do think that there is an opportunity. And I think, you know, as, as Tyler said, the issue of, you know, fighting bias in these models is, is a real one. And it, ha it has to do with finding good training sets. Um, our industry, it has a lot of really good visual data. Um, and it and it can be leveraged for, um, for, tr for training purposes, um, for synthetic content and other AI applications. Um, and I think that you know beyond that, the industry is also really good at making sure that when we deliver our product, we can stand behind it, and we know that the rights 
um, are, are there and that our customers can be comfortable coming to us knowing that they're not going to get themselves into into legal trouble. Um, you know, they, I think a lot of first movers in, in this world have gotten into trouble. And, you know, we're talking about big companies like IBM and, you know, Facebook um, it specifically have gotten into trouble with, um, with biometric laws. Um, and when you're taking a data set, uh, you know, say from like Creative Commons, yeah, you might, there, there might not be um, copyright issues with, with using that. Um, but the people didn't necessarily look at the fact that there there are privacy issues um, and that you need to get consent from a uh, a model to use their biometric information or their face in the, in this training purposes and that has led to some serious um, uh, uh, legal uh, settlements uh, especially in um, in Illinois where the biometric um, privacy act has has been used in a lot of uh, class action lawsuits. Yeah, I, was there more to that question, Tom? Sorry, I forgot. No, I think that's a, I mean, just to, to sort of make it totally clear to people who may not know as much about the technologies, I think these tech, these tech uh, tools are trained on huge data sets of, in this case, images of people. And if you're an agency that has, you know, rights cleared uh, collections of thousands of images of people, then that may be a product that would be valuable to um, a company like, like the two that are here or to others who might be able to license that from you. And it might be a new driver of revenue that you may not even be aware of. Um, I think the only other question there, Paul, was specifically um, what should be worked into model releases or processes to make sure that, you know, say five years down the line, you want to pivot your collection. How, are you, how can you be future proof today to make sure that's cleared? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I lost, lost my train. Uh, thought for a second there, but I think that's a really important question, and it's something that you know we should be consistent on in the industry. Considering you know we often use each other's uh, model releases, and it, it is beneficial to be able to do that. Um, so beyond just getting the release from the model um, that we have now, you you want to get uh, you know explicit uh, release uh, that that their biometric information can be used. And now the the tricky part of that is that. Um, well, the laws are different in other places, but if we're thinking about um, Illinois as sort of like the barometer there, that law gives the gives a model the right to withdraw their consent. And so that's not something that we normally see when we're looking at model releases. So, you know, it's, it's probably a good idea to start thinking operationally about that as well. Uh, how can you, uh, how would you deal with um, taking content out of these collections uh, if a model does withdraw their consent. Thank you, yeah, definitely something to consider for the future, even if you're not planning to license synthetic content, you may be a supplier down the line to, to companies that create it or, or to others that are doing other AI work. Um, Victor, yesterday in the follow-up, and, and again, if anyone has questions to share, we're getting some good ones privately, um, but feel free to either message me in the chat or share to, your question to everyone. Um, Victor, yesterday um, after the, the panel, you mentioned a, a concept of um, an individual creator, say a YouTube creator in their basement could use Synthesia's API um, and you know, maybe some, some imagery, some stock imagery and text and create their own news studio or their own um, product review channel and, uh, and leverage actors to you know, create hundreds or thousands of videos very inexpensively. Could you... Um, go into a little bit more of what, what would that look like um, and how do your technologies facilitate that kind of use? Yeah, certainly. <clears throat> um, I mean, so I think one of the big changes, which I think I also mentioned yesterday, um, it's, it's specifically kind of in the, in the media and the, the media production um, industry that's going to change is that high production value is not going to be a competitive advantage in uh, five or 10 years or something like that, right? If you, if you look at kind of what a YouTube creator can create today, like the type of content they create, uh, most of it is quite low production value. It's still very high engagement, but you're not seeing many YouTubers, uh, you know, uh, spend fifty thousand dollars to create a video that looks really nice, or maybe even more than that. And as these technologies progress, they will be able to create more and more of these kind of things, right? Um, I think the easiest way to think about this is just think about other mediums that have gone through similar uh, types of democratization. So. If you take something like a website, for example, uh, when the internet was launched, creating a website was very, very complex. Um, today, if you want to start a website, you can go into Squarespace or Wix or something like that, 
you click one button and you have a web shop that looks like it was made by you know a big company somewhere so you can kind of you can really easily scale up the production value of your website for example same thing could be said for things like uh, music which is a world that i also used to dabble in right because we can synthesize instruments and effects you don't need to be in a big 10 million dollar recording studio in la to create chart topping hits um, and that that's quite exciting as well so i think that as we move into this world what we are going to see is that a youtuber can create kind of a, a broadcasting network in a box um, using some software from Tunisia, from other companies developing this type of of, uh, of software and they will be able to create um, really enticing content at a very low effort but it's going to look uh, look very very good so I, I think of that as kind of like you know the, the gap between idea and final creation is just going to be uh, you know significantly uh, plucked by these technologies yeah i think that's an exciting possibility to some and maybe um you know something that that others should start to build into their workflows or consider building into their workflows now um ashish uh, one question can you give an example for people who don't know about deep fakes maybe they're hearing about this for the first time or they've just read about it in the media can you give an example of some specific deep fakes and um you know what what was done with them um any impacts that they caused yeah ab <clears throat> absolutely so you know the the term itself was coined in 2017 uh on reddit by a developer who actually created celebrity pornography using the gan the technology where uh uh, they swapped uh, a celebrity face on, on a pornographic video. Uh, from there on, uh, that was a use case which became one of the prominent use cases of deep fakes. Uh, there, was a, there was a journalist in India in 2018 who was reporting against the, the leading political party which was in the government. Uh, and. Uh, it's yet to be proven, but, but her deep fake uh, uh, kind of in, in the revenge pornography scenario was created and was uh, distributed on uh, closed social network like WhatsApp, uh, as well as she was doxxed, uh, meaning her information was uh, like her phone number, email address, and other information, personal information was accompanying that, that, uh, that video. Uh, she ended up in a hospital for six months or so with all kinds of anxiety attacks and depression and whatnot. So that's like a real harm then uh, on an individual. There have been uh, other cases, similar other cases on, on, uh, on individuals as well. Uh, uh, a student, uh, a young uh, woman uh, in Australia, similar kind of uh, harm to, to her. Uh, so that's one side of it. The other, what we have seen real is audio deep fakes, which actually uh, was a very recent one over the weekend. Uh, I was reading about it. So there's this unassuming woman out of California. Uh, she was duped for almost $300,000 by an audio deep fake of a Navy admiral. Uh, so that, that deep fake, audio deep fake uh, pursued her uh, or phone, you know, for a couple of months and, and eventually got, got the money transferred. So that's like real financial fraud using deep audio deep fakes is another example. Uh, I'll, I'll give a last one, uh, which is uh, especially focusing on, on democracy. Uh, so the, a country of Gabon, uh, the president there was, was severely say, ill and uh, there was a rumor uh, that he has died, more or less. Uh, but he was he was going through some some procedure outside of the country. Uh, a video of, of him actually giving a, a New Year's address uh, was released, uh, which uh, was debunked as a deep fake. Even we don't know if it is real or not, right? But but it was termed as deep fake. And the military used that opportunity to do a coup in the country. So again, using using just the idea of deep fake actually uh, involved the military to do a, an unsuccessful coup. It was unsuccessful. So that's another example where a very hyper realistic deep fake or a video which is very very real uh, but fake 
uh, can inflict real harm. Thank you. Yeah, those are, I think, scary, but important to consider, especially because, you know, here in this industry, we may start to see this content come in and we'll have to be aware that it's out there and, and of the very real harm it can cause. Um, we have a, a more of a technical question. Um, what are some of the good open source scan libraries or code to start playing with this technology? I mean, there's a number of open source libraries and I think they're, they're always changing. It depends on the license and, and what you're doing, um, but probably the, the primary driver right now is StyleGAN. Uh, it's originally developed by uh, NVIDIA. And so there's a number of versions on, of that that are out there right now um, and open source nature of all of that means there's multiple implementations. So there's an official style gain implementation by NVIDIA. But there's also a host of others. Um, so I would just recommend going to GitHub and looking at you know, what has the most stars, what is kind of have, has the most traction right now. Uh, NVIDIA has recently released what's called StyleGAN 2-ADA, um, which is probably the fastest training model. Um, it does take significant compute resources to train these models. So it, Keep that in mind. Where unless you have, you know, GPU credits or something like that, it's not anywhere near free um, to get most of these models to something that's really usable. You can get small pictures, but uh, to do like what we're doing, it's many thousands of dollars for even a small run. Thank you, um, and I think that's a good good segue into another question. If you don't want to um, do this yourself, but you do want to start to work with this content, um, both Synthesia and Generated Media um, have. Uh, I think really good sort of entry tiers where you can get started with the technology um, and it's not something where you're spending thousands of dollars. So uh, could each of you just address if somebody says, wow, this is amazing, I wanna test it out um, or even I wanna start to integrate some of these materials into my own library, what is the first step and what are the general costs to get started working with each of you? Yeah, sure, thanks, I, I can go first. So um, I think as, uh, as, as, as mentioned, kind of training these models yourself is can be very expensive first and foremost. And I would also say that uh, I don't know uh, the image space as well as the video space, but for the video space, what you generally is gonna get is also quite a low quality. Um, it's, it's, still, it, it, it's still not just like plug and play and it'll work. Plus, uh, once you start building products around this, you figure out that apart from like the core technology that actually generates the videos or the images, there's so much stuff around it that goes into making it kind of a nice and sleek user experience. Um, so for someone like us, our plan starts at $30 a month, allows you to create 10 minutes of uh, video per month, and you can use the kind of stock actors that we have on our platform. Um, and if you want to create your own actor and upload yourself or one of your colleagues or brand ambassador, that's, uh, that's $500 to do. It takes around two to three minutes of, uh, of filming yourself. And you just send that to us and your actor is going to be ready in a couple of days. So it really is quite easy to get started. We also have enterprise plans. We have an API if you want to integrate our technology into your own platform. Um, we actually very recently um, uh, made a partnership with one of the biggest uh, actor um, or agents in, in the US who are now going to start bringing in loads of, uh, of, of their talent onto our platform. And that's not going to be only on the Synthesia platform. They're actually also going to sell synthetic video via their own uh, online platform. So there's like lots of possibilities of how you can work with us from using our kind of uh, web app, as I showed earlier today, from more kind of full product integrations via our, our API. Great, and Tyler. Yeah, sure. I don't think I've actually shown the platform yet, so I'll give that a quick share. Uh, so we're actually really easy to work with. I mean, our entry level is free, where we offer just uh, JPEG images that are 512 by 512 resolution. Uh, completely for free. So you can just click on a person, you know, see, pick whoever you want to, to go through it. We have a full custom made web platform that's uh, very full featured in terms of what you can do to select uh, age, ethnicity, everything. It's just a click away. Uh, if you want to do bulk downloads, we offer that as well, um, where you can, you know, just select the photos you want, add them to your cart and check out with an arbitrary number. We have a, a pretty unique little selection process here that lets you get exactly the style and type of person you would like. So if you have a very specific need, which we find most of our customers do, uh, you can specify exactly what you want. If you just have a, a smaller kind of ongoing assortment, we do have, uh, like Victor mentioned, a subscription plan, which right now is only 20 bucks a month. Uh, and that gets you full resolution uh, PNG images that all have transparent backgrounds, which is another machine learning process we do. We also have a full API plan 
uh, that you can make as many requests as you want to. It's all enterprise ready. That's what powers this platform here. Um, and as it shows up at the top here, we have over 2.6 million photos you know, on the web now. So you really can just keep clicking and clicking and there will be more and more photos as you go. Um, so it's a pretty impressive number of photos uh, that you can go from there. So if you wanna do even more custom work, uh, we do offer you know, one-on-one -on -one data sets or custom generation processes. So just get in touch with us with us if you are interested in that. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that's a, a good good um, question for Paul. If we in our industry are starting to use content, um, what are some questions we should be asking of suppliers um, and uh, and particularly you know model releases? Um, and, and other kinds of considerations we would look at with our own content, how might that apply to synthetic content? And again, you know, what kinds of things should we be saying to suppliers to make sure that um, everybody's producing this in a, in a legitimate way? Um, yeah, so, so definitely. Um, you know, I went through a couple practical tips yesterday. Um, I think I could just hit on, on some of those. Um, you know, obvious ones, uh, only work with with reputable vendors who really stand behind their product and stand behind the the data um, that they've used to create their product. Um, you know, ask them what what data was used when they were creating um, uh, these these synthetic images. What was used in the machine learning process? If they hesitate about that, that's probably a sign that you you you're taking on too much risk um, when when working with them. Uh, if they don't know, then then you know you should you should probably uh, avoid them. Um, as I said before, you know make sure that they have considered the biometric uh, uh, data that we talked about. It's not just about copyright. Um, there are other third party rights that that may be implemented. Uh, make sure that they have they've thought about all of those. Um, and you know we want. Uh, you also want to make sure that they have maintained an auditable record of how these things were created. Um, and so that, you know, that, that you can go back and ask questions and it isn't just a, a black box. Um, you know, they may not be willing to tell you the full details because uh, that might be proprietary to their business, um, but just having them know that, 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 that um, those audible records are there, I think is a very, um, a very good thing uh, to ask for. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, I think it, you know, this, this might be go, it might be obvious, but think about what you're actually using this content for. Like it should not be used in the editorial context. Um, it does not, you know, that, that is where I think deep fakes get, get to be very dangerous, right? When, when someone is looking at a, at a synthetic image and presenting that as, as truth or presenting that as, as the news, uh, if you are an editorial uh, distributor or supplier, that you know that obviously can get you in a lot of trouble, and that would um, that would really harm you know your editorial integrity if you're if you're throwing in fake images and um, and considering them to be to be real. Um, in the I think in the creative context, there's a lot more free uh, you know leeway, but I think it's still a good idea to label something that is synthetic uh, as synthetic so that you, you're being as transparent as possible. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's definitely going to be an important consideration as more of this content comes in, developing those policies, maybe even developing them at the level of, uh, of DMLA down the line. Um, the next one's a, a two-part uh, question. Um, the first part is for Ashish. The second one, I think, is kind of for everybody. Um, can you describe, Ashish, a little bit of what a, like a face replacement technology would be if you had, for example, an existing photo um, or video where you linked the photo and uh, the environment and, and the context uh, and you wanted to um, swap a face in? either, I guess, for a good purpose or for a negative one, and, you know, how does that work and how does that tie into deep fakes? And then uh, for, the, for uh, Tyler and Victor, is this something you've considered? Um, specifically, a use case could be that a stock site could customize the ethnicity or age of a stock photo for a particular buyer need an existing stock photo. So uh, Shish, can you start off there? Yeah, so so again, yeah, I go back to the, the, the types of defect when, when we start tracking, right? So we've tried to track as much, you know, we can, but 
Uh, so face swapping is one where you actually would, would take an, uh, someone else's face and, and try to actually uh, either implant it on some other's face, you know, obviously digitally. Uh, uh, so that's one. Uh, there's another one which we call lip syncing, where you can render mouth movement accordingly. Uh, uh, puppeteering, where you, the body movements actually can also be implanted. Uh, text generation. Uh, image synthesis, which Tyler and, and, and Victor are doing. Uh, face swapping essentially works in a, in a the, the, the process will be, right, and very simplistic way to explain it will be you use technology. And so just, let's just, let's do it on an image, right? So you have an image of, of, of uh, the subject. Uh, you use technology to detect where the face is, the landmarks on the face, right? Uh, then you manipulate them using technology, meaning, you know, you take another set of, of artifacts from other face and try to graft it using technology again. But the, the bottom line there is your algorithm has to detect where the face landmarks are on a subject, image of the subject. And then the last part you do is once you're done grafting, you try to mask or, or clean it up essentially, you know, remove any, any semantic errors that may have happened during the process. You know, blending of the face, you know, may, you may do masking color and pixel manipulation a bit, which we call masking or blending. So this is like three-step process, identify a face, graft it using technology and then mask it or, or blend it, clean, clean it up. Uh, now, I go back to, so, so this is how you create. Now I go back to, you know, how can you then use technology to detect if there was a face uh, manipulation or face swap has happened? We call it face swap, but the, that's the part of a technology as well. There is an open source library called face swap, but I just call it face swap, right? So you can intervene on, on three stages as the three stages I talk about, right? One of the things you can do is uh, what we call an adversarial attack on a picture, meaning, you know, if I can include some kind of pixels or, or some kind of uh, AI mechanism in a subject picture so that the algorithm cannot even figure out where the face is, even the humans can, so the algorithm, algorithm can get confused. So that's one way to actually adversarial attack a picture so that cannot be face swapped. The other is when you do manipulation, there are pixel-based manipulations, so there are semantic pixel bait attribute based you know you can figure out some algorithms can figure out hey is the image has uh, like one of the examples everyone talks about is uh, a women's image with two different earrings right which typically won't happen except halloween but you know, i'm just joking but you know that's like a semantic inconsistency that you can figure out and then the last thing which we call is is blending artifact right you know it's a kind of cleaning and there are some detection technology. In fact, our detection technology that we released, I think 40 days back, 50 days back called Video Authenticator, which actually looks at the blending boundary and can predict you know, if the face was blended by a, with another face. So that's how you create and that's how you try to detect uh, face swaps. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting to know how these are made from, from more of a, well, not a totally technical perspective, but a little more of the tech behind it. Um, for both Tyler and Victor, um, that's sort of the negative use case. Is this something that you could see or that you're working on using to uh, customize existing photos or videos in the way that, uh, that the um, person who asked the question uh, was hinting? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're actively working on this right now. Uh, we have you know, internal systems that do this. Um, we're kind of waiting until the quality improves a little bit. So we're, we're actively working on it now. So. On, on the positive sides of these, I mean, you can, can do a lot of like identity protection with this. So whether that's busting facial recognition or identification, where you can kind of keep your same look and slightly change your face. So we actually have a new product that's gonna launch in maybe a month or so. Uh, that's an anonymizer that kind of finds your, your nearest neighbor photo uh, that since we've generated so many now, there's almost a look alike for a lot of people. Uh, and, and at that point, you can kind of find something that's similar to you and still use it as an avatar or something like that. That's slightly different than actual face swap, but we actually do have face swap as well. So you'll be able to take it, say, a photo of yourself 
and face swap, a fully generated face that does not have any recognition through uh, face ID or any of those type of things and put that on a photo and still have people kind of squint a little bit and see if it's you or not. And most people probably won't care that much. Um, so that's, that's one interesting positive use case. Otherwise, just as people have said here, uh, the concept of style mixing is really interesting where you can kind of artificially create exactly, uh, say targeted ads for exactly the product you want based on you know demographic information. And so we're working with that as well. Um, and that's definitely in the future of where we're going as a brand uh, in terms of being able to manipulate pretty much every part of the content. But as Ashish kind of mentioned, right now there, there are some artifacts, there are some kind of inconsistencies. I wouldn't say the quality is quite as high as the, the official full-blown photos. And that's why we're gonna start with uh, an anonymizer tool. And, uh, that's great, yeah, and Victor? Yeah, I think I think my my answer is gonna be, be very much uh, like Tyler's. Uh, we're working on you know in general making the videos better, more customizable, adding emotions, adding body language, doing full body synthesis that includes hands and all those kind of kind of natural things. Um, that is in a video, so that's that definitely something we're working on um, in that regard. I think for in terms of the specific question, I I don't really think so. Like we do work with detection. Algos, like we work with uh, Google, for example, we supply data to, to, to for them to train the detection algorithm. So in that way, we we also help out on, on the detection side. It's not really an area of technology that we are super interested in ourselves. I think there are people who are better at it, but we definitely help out um, where we can and you know, are, are keen to sort of collaborate to the wider ecosystem around um, creating uh, security and safety tools as well. Great. Um, so we have about, uh, yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting use case for advertising and uh, and you know news reading and that kind of thing if you're able to customize the, the presenter or the model in a in you know creative that may have been shot in the real world with um, different faces depending on who's looking at it or where they're looking at it definitely technology that, that may be coming down the line um, we have about uh, five a little over five minutes left here um, I just want to open it up. Um, and ask the general question to everybody, um, what are you working on now personally with these technologies um, in terms of your company? Uh, what are you excited about? Um, what do you see as sort of your own next steps to your company or, or uh, uh, you know, your piece of the industry's next steps? I'm happy to go first. I think for us, as I just mentioned, you know, there is a kind of a ladder that we are climbing in terms of the quality that we can produce and um, which in the end uh, sort of determines what kind of use cases that we can work on. So from going to sort of, let's say, internal communications, more marketing based content, uh, you know, there are certain things we want to improve on the emotion side of things and body language and you know, going to more kind of full frame synthesis of, of everything that's going on in the video, not just the person, but also the background and the environment, for example. So that's the kind of track we're on. I think also uh, maybe as an addition to the question before, I, I know that's something a lot of people are working on uh, as well in this space, but it, being able to create synthetic actors or avatars is also something they'd be very interested in, right? So. In, in, in not so long, you'll be able to go on our platform and also create a person that doesn't exist. So sort of like the technology that Tyler is developing, but for video content. So let's say you're a brand and you want to have, uh, you know, a variety of different actors that that um, that might go well with, with different types of people. You'll be able to go on the platform and simply just through kind of a slider based interface, um, being able to create these kind of video avatars for your brand, right? So that's it. That's something we're quite excited about. And then from us, it's also a big part of it is just in in the kind of non AI side of things, just building a product that's great to use for customers and enterprises. Um, I think as with with most deep tech uh, type of technologies, you kind of start out building the core of it, but then you figure out that to really build a good product, you have to do lots of integrations and enterprise ready features and security and all sort of stuff. So that's uh, that's that's what we're kind of working on. Yeah, and, uh, I, I'd love to share a, a little demo on on kind of similar kind of aspects of where to go with AI. Uh, so apart from generated photos, even though it, it uses generated photos, uh, I've been working quite a lot with uh, something that Ashish and Microsoft have helped uh, make possible, which is GPT-3. Uh, so that's on the different side of things where you're actually using text to generate synthetic media. Um, and so it's a natural language transformer. Uh, it won't get into the specifics of exactly how it works, but it is quite fascinating. Uh, so something that I've built on, on the side uh, is called Honest AI, where it's a, the beginnings of a site that's going to probably spin off other projects as well. But 
it's really trying to explain AI and what it can and can't do at this point. Because I think there's a lot of confusion and misinformation out there of, you know, the robots are coming or AGI, which is uh, general intelligence is right around the corner. And some of those things are a little skeptical to me. Uh, so here's a, here's a demo that I recorded where uh, GPT-3 can parse general information. So I'm describing a person here. So, you know, a, a young black woman with you know, physical attributes that you can type in for hair, eyes, whatever you want. Um, and then you just hit generate. And what's happening here is behind the scenes, I'm actually creating a very in-depth bot. So I'm kind of creating the negative case that Ashish will have to defend against in the future here. I'm not releasing this to the public, but there's many different calls to GPT-3 being made here. What this does is it can create a full persona. So this person has a personality and it creates a, like a, a LinkedIn page, let's say an example here where it says what they are, what they do for a living, where they live, and it's all very consistent um, in terms of you know, their career progression and all of that is constant. And you can actually talk to them and they have a consistent personality because the context is backfed every single time. So this is the type of kind of interplay between you know, interaction or video games or personas that you can see where you know, it automatically from that text got the right person. You know, that's using the generated photos API. And so those type of use cases are, are really unique and interesting. And I think that is quite near the future of where things are gonna go from here. Uh, but I just wanted to share that quick demo. So I think that will be pretty interesting. Thank you. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm sorry, we have to end at this point. Um, we have a few specific questions for Paul and Ashish that are much more technical or legal um, that I can pass on uh, after the fact. Um, and I just wanna say uh, thank you to everybody so much, um, to all the panelists here for coming out to, uh, to talk to us. If you have specific questions, feel free to email me afterwards, tom at gottoimages.com, and I'm happy to pass along uh, any other questions you may have. And again, Ashish and Paul, I'll pass on some of the legal and very technical uh, kinds of questions that we've gotten from some people. So thank you again so much, everybody. Thank you to the sponsors for making this possible. And uh, again, any questions or any follow-ons, please feel free to reach out to me directly at tom at gottoimages.com.